everybody, welcome to Talk It Out with me, Li Jingjing. So today my guest is Carlos Martinez from London. He is the organizer of No Cold War campaign. Today we're going to talk about many issues like socialism, capitalism, his personal experience traveling across China, anti-China propaganda in the West, and the reason of founding No Cold War campaign. Thanks very much, Jingjing, for having me on the show. My name is Carlos Martinez. I'm based in London, England. I'm an activist and campaigner and, and writer and researcher. I'm one of the founders of the No Cold War campaign, which we set up uh, this, about this time last year. I run a website, a blog called Invent the Future, and I've written a book of, about the collapse of the Soviet Union called The Beginning. And I'm currently working on a book about, about China and presenting Chinese socialism to a Western progressive audience. Hmm. I noticed that um, you've been very vocal, spreading positive information coming out from China. And you've been very active on Twitter, you have your own websites, writing articles about China. Like, how come? So in terms of my politics, I'm a socialist and I'm a Marxist. And, and like other people on the left, I feel that while capitalism has encouraged, you know, the, de the development of science and technology to a certain degree, mm -hmm. it remains incapable of solving certain problems problems, certain key problems, you know, it, it doesn't seem to be able to solve inequality, racism, sexism, war, alienation, conflict and, and division, and also is taking the planet to the edge of the cliff in terms of environmental destruction. So I think the world needs to move in the direction of socialism, but it's actually quite difficult to persuade people about that if they're bombarded with this constant propaganda about socialist countries, and China in particular is the biggest and it's the most prominent socialist country, if people think that China is some sort of cruel, totalitarian, imperialist, genocidal place, then they'll think that socialism is a bad system. On the other hand, if they hear some of the reality of China, if they hear about the most extensive poverty alleviation program in history, about how China was able to mobilize to defeat the COVID pandemic, about how China's leading the way in terms of renewable energy and electric vehicles, about how China's gone from being one of the poorest countries in the world to having uh, you know, a reasonably good life expectancy, the same as the US, good living conditions, about how China has gone from being a technically very backward country to being increasingly a science and technology superpower, then perhaps people would conclude that socialism is a good system. So that's that's kind of why I tried to tell the truth about China, because it gives people a more accurate picture, a more accurate understanding of world politics and of socialism. And you don't think that China is a, like authoritarian, ruthless, cruel regime that oppress people? No, I mean, this is a caricature. This is this is what you think about China. If all you were, if all you came across was kind of the, the Western media portrayal. I went to China myself in December 2019 for three weeks as part of a Silk Road tour, actually. Um, so a few of us went to Beijing, to Xi'an, to Dunhuang, to Urumqi. We spent a few days in each place and we traveled by, by high-speed rail. And you know, there were some of us on the tour from Britain, from London, some from the US, uh, different places in the new US, but mainly New York and Chicago. And I think everybody was really struck by how modern and how clean and how nice um, the, the, the Chinese cities are and how good the quality of life is. One thing that really struck us immediately was that you can walk around Beijing all day to different suburbs and you won't see homelessness. You won't see people who don't have access you know, to, to, to anywhere to live. Whereas if you were to go to, to New York, and step on the metro at any station, you will immediately see numerous homeless people. And you know, in New York City alone, which is not a massive city, there are there are literally tens of thousands of people who don't have anywhere to live. So it's incredible to to see a place like Beijing or Xi'an or, or Guangzhou or Shanghai, which are part of the developing world, but they've been able to solve a, a, a major problem that faces humanity. And you know, I'm, my father's from India. I've been to Delhi many times. I've been to Mumbai. I've been to Cochin and other other cities in India. And the the picture's completely different because you see very stark poverty, 
everywhere you go. There's a, there's a Egyptian theorist called Samir Amin, um, who visited China many times and had traveled the world. And he, he described China as a poor country where you don't see poor people. Um, and, and by contrast, he talked about places like Brazil as a relatively rich country where you only see poor people. Um, so yeah, it was, it was really interesting to go to China and I, I would strongly encourage people to visit China because what you see in reality was 100% different from, from the portrayal that you get if you read the BBC or if you read the Guardian or if you watch Sky News or whatever. Um, for example, we went to, to Xinjiang, we went to Urumqi um, and you know, we, we weren't on a fact-finding mission. It wasn't that type of delegation. We didn't have this specific objective of verifying the truth of the various allegations that are made in relation to the treatment of Uyghurs. But we did. We walked freely around Urumqi um, and, and also the Muslim quarter in Xi'an. We certainly didn't see any evidence of kind of religious oppression or ethnic oppression. In Urumqi, one sees mosques everywhere. In fact, I believe that Xinjiang has per capita one of the highest number of mosques anywhere in the world. Um, we walked freely, like not just in the tourist areas, not just in the central area. Um, we saw hundreds of Chinese Muslims wearing like distinctive um, Uyghur clothing, headscarves included for many women, um, people going about their lives without any indication that they were living like in fear of persecution. We, we ate in Uyghur restaurants where we had halal foods. Um, when you couldn't have pork there, obviously, you couldn't have alcohol there. Um, so, I mean, what's true is that levels of security in Urumqi are, are much higher than other places we visited. Um, you walk through metal detectors and you have your bags x-rayed and things like that, um, which is, of course, a response to the wave of terror attacks uh, starting in the 1990s. But the impression that we got is that people accept that heightened level of security on the basis that, along with other things, along with the poverty alleviation efforts, along with the education efforts, mm -hmm. it's actually been successful in preventing terrorism and allowing people to live safely and allowing people to live in peace. So that's that's kind of the big difference that we noticed in, in Urumqi compared to say Beijing or Xi'an. Um, but certainly, as I said, you know, you can walk around a long time in Urumqi really trying to see some kind of evidence of religious oppression and you'll be frustrated you won't see that. The impression from the real trip to China was completely different from what the, what the media was portraying when you were like before you came to China. Yeah, 100%. Um, for example, you walk around all day in Beijing from one side of the city to another and you cannot even see a police officer. You cannot even see someone from the army. Um, you, know, the, you certainly don't get the impression that people are sort of listening to your conversation. And you know, if you say anything bad about the Chinese Communist Party, then you're going to uh, be in a prison within five minutes. <laughs> um, but that's, that's the, you know, it's, it's a ridiculous caricature, but that's actually the idea that people have about China, that it's just an extremely repressive society and that people don't have any kind of individual rights. They have, you know, that there's a, a human rights crisis in China. Whereas actually you've got um, a tremendous level of individual freedom there and human rights are improving all the time. Um, and as, as um, Kishore Mabubani, who's a, a Singaporean diplomat, mm -hmm. writes, he's, he's got a, bo a book out recently called Has China Won? Um, he says, well, one thing you can say for sure about human rights in China and individual freedoms is that today's Chinese population have much better human rights and much greater individual freedoms than Chinese people have ever had in history. So let's at the very least recognize that even if there are problems, the trajectory is a very positive and a very impressive yeah. one. Wow. You started No Cold War after the trip from China? Yeah, that's right. We launched No Cold War in I think April or May last year. And the background was that there was this increasingly hysterical and dangerous anti-China campaign that was being led by the US government and the media. And 
you, you, you know, the hostility to China in Western policy circles has been increasing for a number of years, mm -hmm. as basically as it becomes clear that China is on its way to becoming a major power and it poses some kind of threat to, to US dominance, to US hegemony. The pivot to Asia was initiated, for example, by the Obama administration. The trade war had been in place for two to three years. Um, the US has been stoking tensions in the South China Sea and engaged in a, a, an escalation or a China encirclement campaign for a long time. But the Trump administration really took the hostilities to a higher level. And especially with the pandemic, I think the Republicans essentially realized that there was a pretty good chance that they were going to lose the election if hundreds of thousands of people died from the from the pandemic, which they have. Um, so they escalated their, their attacks on China in, in frankly, a very racist way in order to try and get support. Um, you know, they were failing to contain the pandemic, so they decided to try and focus people's attentions on this big external enemy of China. So we had the attempts to blame the pandemic on China, referring to it as the China virus or the Wuhan virus. There were diplomatic attacks such as closing the consulate in Houston, stepping up the propaganda war in terms of Xinjiang and, and Hong Kong in particular. So last year it felt like that this new Cold War against China was increasing in intensity. And, and here in the West, I think it felt that we needed a more coordinated response from those of us who are against war and who understand that it's not actually a good idea to, to demonize and attack another country. Um, I think the people who formed the campaign believe that the new Cold War is potentially very dangerous, uh, that wars can, can have unintended consequences and side effects and easily turn into obstacles, um, and that therefore people throughout the world should be working to prevent it. You know, the most important reason ultimately is that, we, you know, whether we're in London or, or New York or Beijing, we're all the same species, we're sharing the same planet, we share, share the same natural resources, and we face a lot of the same problems. You know, these problems, pandemics, climate change, war, poverty, they require cooperation, coordination. Um, they can't be solved in the context of military threats, relentless propaganda, diplomatic hostility. You know, the, the pandemic is a perfect example. All countries need to cooperate on vaccine development, on containment measures, on information sharing, on early warning systems, on epidemiological research. If we don't do that, then we're not gonna be able to defeat the pandemic. The same is the case for climate change. You know, the whole world needs to to take it seriously and to work together. Otherwise, the whole world is going to suffer. So as a campaign, we really believe that those major problems we face in the world have to be solved at a global level and that any kind of Cold War stands in the way of that. You know, we stand for global cooperation, mutual understanding and against decoupling, against uh, Cold War. But I think uh, too many people they're probably going to be very surprised knowing there are people like you guys uh, that are outside of China, that are not Chinese, but are willing to speak up for China, um, fight against U.S. government's aggressive actions and statements towards China. And some, probably, some people probably going to guess, well, you guys probably are just founded by Chinese government to speak positive things about China. I think that already happened during the last forum we had. Um, last November, some some people already speculating whether you guys are founded by Chinese government. So, <laughs> can you tell us what was the reason? Yeah, I mean, I think probably from outside, um, from outside the West, it's difficult to understand how much sort of ideological pressure there is, um, and there's this mainstream narrative that is able to construct essentially fake news about China. And it's it's the same process that had people believing that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction and that it could attack London or Washington within 45 minutes. People believing that he was about to portray a massacre in Benghazi, Libya, before it was very to get people on board and build public support for an attack on Libya or or on Iraq, or before that Yugoslavia, or before that, um, or before that Vietnam, and the Tonkin incident. You know, 
there's these are established methods of building a public consensus to build public support for attack. You know, in this case, in terms of all the kind of basically pretty hysterical propaganda around Xinjiang and around Taiwan and around the South China Sea and around Hong Kong. Um, it's about building support for the new Cold War. It's about building support for this process of military escalations, rearmament of Japan, um, the placing of the FAD missile system in Guam and in South Korea, um, the construction of military bases all around the Pacific. You know, the US has 800 military bases. Um, and you know, their number one target is containing China um, and preventing a system whereby US hegemony is broken and we move to a more uh, to a more democratic, a multipolar system of international relations. So essentially the US administration in particular is very much focused on preventing that from happening and demonizing China and pursuing a new Cold War is, is a part of that. And Britain in particular is joining in with that, especially after Brexit, we're in a situation where Britain very much needs to have strong, close economic relations with the US. And, and that essentially means kind of outsourcing its foreign policy and, and you know, allowing its foreign policy to be written in Washington rather than in London. Yeah, I, I think the EU, there are still contradictions there in terms of the relationship between continental Europe and China, but the, the EU is able to act with much more independence because it's much less reliant on the US. But unfortunately with Britain, you can see in terms of offering the BNO passports to Hong Kong, um, to Hong Kong residents, so offering residency to Hong Kong residents in terms of um, cutting Huawei out of the 5G infrastructure. At this point, you know, we're taking our instructions from the US. Mm -hmm. um, so there is there is this huge pressure. And when you go when you go against that mainstream narrative, which has become very powerful and that and that is really targeted on at a progressive ideology, you know, people who want human rights, you know, with, you know every, we all want human rights, you know, um, and people who want there not to be, you know, for example, genocide of Muslim people, then if you say, well, this is fake news then you can easily be accused of saying, oh, well, you're someone, you're, you're denying genocide. You're someone who, who hates Muslim people. You're, you're, you're engaging in Islamophobia. You know, never mind that you might have spent your whole political life fighting against Islamophobia and fighting against the genocidal wars that have been waged against Muslim countries by Britain and by the US in Afghanistan, in um, Iraq, in Syria, in Libya. Um, or, you know, or for the rights of Palestinian people. But now, because you're not buying into this fake news narrative, then all of a sudden, you know, there's a lot of pressure on you that, that you're a genocide denier and that you're against mus Muslim people and Muslim traditions and beliefs. Um, so yeah, that, that, is, that is a lot of pressure. And, you know, almost any time I say something like I do a TV appearance or write an article defending something or saying something positive about China, um, for example, about poverty alleviation, which you would think people would be happy about, that, um, that China has been able to lift 800 million people out of extreme poverty. Like there's no, it doesn't even have a parallel anywhere in, in world history. Um, you say that and all of a sudden people are asking you, oh, well, you must be on Xi Jinping's payroll. You know, how much is the CPC paying you? <laughs> I, I do see how powerful this propaganda skill is in Western media. And then um, like media like BBC, The Guardian or CNN keep pushing these narratives. And I kind of feel from what I saw on Twitter or Facebook, a large amount of people in the West genuinely believe there were genocide or there were concentration camps in Xinjiang. There were systematic rape in Xinjiang. <laughs> so you read those news as well. But how, how do you judge the whole situation? Do you believe the Western reports at all? I've been involved in politics for something like 20 years. So I'm used to reading the Western media with a critical eye. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we in the West, I guess, independence of the press 
um, press freedom is considered as sort of a, you know, a fundamental human right, um, although it's exercised in a slightly discriminatory way when you consider what's been done with CGTN recently. But your uh, freedom of speech and independence of the press is considered a very important thing. But that kind of masks the fact that the press, there's an ownership structure around the media. You know, I can't just set up uh, a major news website. You know, that requires millions and millions of pounds. Um, so, you know, even the so-called independent press it's still a capitalist press, and it's still um, it's still pushing a narrative that suits particular interests. And in Britain, those are tied to the interests of the British government and the British ruling class. In the US, the press is tied to the interests of the US government and the American ruling class. Um, so I'm used to reading in a in a critical way, and I feel like people should really read more critical read more critically because we all recognise now the what was said about the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq was a lie. And we all recognize now that what was said about Libya before NATO launched its war was a lie. Um, so we don't have to look back very far in history mm -hmm. to see that there's this pattern where uh, the media pushes forward a particular narrative that, as I said before, uh, around a, a specific piece of foreign policy. In, in those cases, uh, uh, full, full-scale wars in Iraq or Afghanistan or Libya or Syria or Yugoslavia. In this case, around the Cold War with China. So I think, you know, I and and some other people have learned to to engage with the media more critically, and I think it's really important that far more people learn to do that. Speaking of the media, and you also mentioned the CGTN, because No Cold War yesterday published this open letter signed by several veteran journalists, filmmakers, and artists opposing Ofcom's decision uh, to revoke CGTN's broadcasting license. And so i um, wondering, what do you make of that? What's the reason behind this open letter? I think we recognize that the removal of CGTN's broadcast license is it's a political act. It's another thing that forms part of British foreign policy and the Cold War on China. It's got nothing to do with Ofcom's rules. We know that because there are lots of state-owned broadcasters that continue to have a license in the UK. The most obvious example being the BBC, which is accountable to the British government. Um, and there are several other state-run television stations that operate in Britain, including from France, from South Korea from Japan and so on. Another state broadcaster that did have its license removed a few years ago is Press TV, the Iranian TV station. So if we're looking for a pattern of which countries have their licenses removed, it seems to be those countries that Britain has political tensions with. You know, it's, it's not around wh whether countries have violated some rule or not. So in other words, Ofcom isn't acting independently itself. It's acting as an extension of the British government and Britain's foreign relations. It's participating in the new Cold War in, in a, basically a rather crude and blundering way that hurts Britain's represent, uh, it hurts Britain's reputation and it hurts Britain's self-image. Britain thinks of itself as a democratic country, as a country that supports freedom of speech, but removing CGTN's license is a clear violation of free speech and it harms the British population because it means that British people don't have access to an alternative voice. CGTN was one of the very few voices in the British media sphere that gave a positive and at least a more realistic portrayal of what happens in China. Mm -hmm. um, so instead of promoting understanding between the British people and the Chinese people, um, we're promoting misunderstanding between Britain and China, which is kind of obviously a bad idea. And you know, it's, it's hardly a coincidence that in the last few weeks, aside from revoking CGTN's broadcast license, Britain has also dispatched its Navy ships to, to the South China Sea in a, in a statement of support essentially for NATO and for the US's China encirclement strategy, which itself is a very irresponsible, a hostile act and a threat to peace. You know, what would the 
I wonder what the British public's response would be if Chinese warships came into British waters, um, you know, just off the coast of London. Mm -hmm. um, furthermore, the British government last year acted in accordance with Mike Pompeo's instructions and decided to remove Huawei from Britain's 5G infrastructure in spite of the fact that investigations showed that Huawei wasn't using its equipment for any kind of uh, illegal or nefarious purposes. You know, they, they researched it and they proved that Huawei wasn't attempting to compromise British security. Meanwhile, the British government has been interfering in Chinese internal affairs by offering residency to BNO passport holders in Hong Kong and supporting separatism in Hong Kong. So we've got this series of hostile acts perpetrated by the British government against China. And these are part of this new Cold War, which is designed by the US, it's led by the US. But you know, as I said before, in the wake of Brexit, Britain feels like it needs to prove its loyalty to the US to try and get a good trade deal to improve its economic relationship. It's very unfortunate and it's short-sighted. You know, it makes such obvious sense for Britain to cultivate good relations with China. China is going to be a crucial source of investment for Britain. It's a major export market for Britain. Um, you know, if anything's going to save British manufacturing after Brexit, it's uh, you know 400, 500 million middle-income Chinese people, um, and that's a relationship that China is putting on the table. This is what China wants. This is what China wants to make available: a win-win relationship where we can trade, where we can have people-to-people -people exchanges. Um, and generally deepen our understanding and, you know, and both sides benefit mutually. Um, but Britain, as it stands, is rejecting that offer, which is, which is a shame and ultimately a mistake. And why do you think, uh, either to you or to people in Britain, why is it important to get information from media like, like CGTN? Well, at a, at a kind of abstract level, I think, you know, if we can use a, a Maoist expression, it's good to let a hundred flowers bloom. Um, and you know, it's good to have multiple different perspectives and different media sources that the result of that is going to be a richer understanding. Uh, specifically in this situation, as we've talked about, the, the typical, the mainstream media presentation of China is so negative it focuses on and exaggerates only problems uh, up to the point of literally inventing fake news and pushing outright lies. So to at the very least have one or two media outlets that can give people an alternative perspective um, and that might A, counter the lies and counter the fake news and B, present very positive aspects of China you know, for example, what China is doing in terms of leading the world with renewable energy. You know, people, wouldn't people be pleased to know that 90% of renewable energy installation in the last year was in China, or that China aims to have 20 or 25% of vehicles as electric vehicles within the next few years, things like that. Wouldn't China, wouldn't people be pleased to know that um, China's eliminated extreme poverty. I mean, that was barely a news item in Britain when there were the, the ceremonies in Beijing a week or two ago. It, it, it barely made the headlines. And where it did make the headlines, people were complaining that, oh, well, we're not sure about the, the definition of extreme poverty, that this $1.90 World Bank figure, um, we don't know if that really applies correctly to China, and maybe these people are still very poor. They don't mention things like actually the Chinese um, evaluation, the, the gauge for extreme poverty isn't purely numeric, but it also includes, includes do people have access to housing? Do people have access to food? Do people have access to water? Do people have access to education? Do people have access to basic health services? Um, you know, on, on this basis, what, what counts as being poor in China, actually for most parts of the developing world would be considered middle income because to have your own piece of land and, and not be in debt to a landlord and to have access to free education and basic healthcare services and to have secure, secure housing is, 
is, is an amazing thing. And to achieve that for 1.4 billion Chinese is historically incredible. Um, but the British media doesn't report on it. The US media doesn't report on it. So of course, it would be good to have the CGTN as this kind of one lonely voice portraying some of the, the positives and the reality of China. The portrayal of China in Britain is almost exclusively negative. Um, it hasn't always been that way. Um, you know, it, maybe five or 10 years ago, it was somewhat more balanced. But in the last few years, it has transitioned towards being almost 100% negative. And, and the British ambassador said in her response to all of this um, situation, well, the outgoing ambassador, the outgoing Chinese ambassador to Britain, Yu Xiaoming, he had written maybe 150 articles in British newspapers and his voice wasn't suppressed. So why is my voice being suppressed? But your, Liu Xiaoming, it's, it's, you know, he wrote a number of articles that appeared in the Daily Telegraph, the Financial Times and various other places. But that was kind of, you know, for, for every hundred articles that are viscerally hostile to China, you have this one article that it was made very clear that it was written by the Chinese ambassador that presents a more realistic picture. Um, but what Yu Xiaoming never did was to, to breach diplomatic protocol that you don't criticize the, the, the host country's political system, which is what the British ambassador has done in China. She says, well, yeah, I haven't been allowed to write these articles or I'm being criticized for writing these articles, but Yu Xiaoming wrote lots of articles in Britain. But Yu Xiaoming didn't, didn't criticize Britain. Yu Xiaoming didn't talk about how Britain's political system was fundamentally flawed and in many ways undemocratic, which you could, you know, I could quite easily write an article for you <laughs> about the problems of Britain's, <laughs> Britain's political system and you know, the, the flaws in its democracy. Um, but as a diplomat, of course, you know, that there's a certain protocol that's agreed at an international level, um, which Liu Xiaoming followed very rigorously and that the British ambassador in China hasn't, you know, so she doesn't really have a leg to stand on in terms of her complaint, you know, she should, she should follow the, the protocol and the procedures that are agreed worldwide for how diplomats act, and not act as if, you know, we're, that we're going back 100 years, where China and, and Britain have an unequal relationship, and Britain can treat China however it wants, and China won't respond, you know, the world has changed. And I think, but you can tell me, you know, better than I do. But I think the Chinese people demand to be treated with respect and demand to be treated as an equal. Um, you know, and that there's a historical memory that remembers the century of humiliation, that remembers the Opium Wars, that remembers the seizure of Hong Kong, that remembers the non the unequal treaties, um, and and that says, you know, the past is the past, and that's history. But we're we're very clear that we're not, you know, that's, that can't come back, you know, we want Britain and China to have good relations and mutually beneficial win-win relationship, but it can't be on the basis of Britain being, you know, more equal, Britain having more weight in that relationship, Britain being able to treat China however it wants and China not retaliating like in what way capitalism is failing in dealing with issues like equality, poverty, alleviation, or, uh, or racism? Yeah, well, um, so in, I told you that in 2019, late in 2019, I went to Beijing for the first time. And in that same year, a few months earlier, I went to New York for the first time. And it's really interesting to see the contrast um, because people talk about how inequality is, is increasingly a problem in China. Um, and of course, you know, there's inequality in China and that's a well understood problem. But the, the level at the bottom of that inequality range is much higher in China than it is in the US or in Britain. You know, the US is you know, one of the world's richest countries and it's kind of the almost the spiritual home of capitalism, if you like. You know, it considers itself as being the quintessential successful advanced capitalist democracy. And yet 
there's a huge proportion, literally tens of millions of people who live in, in abject poverty, who don't know where the next meal is coming from. Um, there's hundreds of thousands of people who are, who are homeless, who don't have a roof over their heads, um, and, and who are living on the streets or going from kind of train to train on, on, the, on the New York Metro. Um, racism is an enormous problem. Incarceration is an enormous problem. You know, there's, the US has more than 2 million people in prison, which is by far the highest incarceration rate in the world. Their actual incarceration rate, the number of people per capita in prison is, is six or seven times higher than it is in China. But the media portrays China as a prison nation and they portray US as the land of the free. Um, so it's difficult to understand the discrepancy and the contradiction there, because um, because it's you know if you were to go on the numbers, if you were to look on the at the data and the facts, then you would have to say that it's the U.S. That, that's the prison nation, and while the the African American, the Black population, only constitutes I think around ten percent of the U.S. population overall, they constitute between forty and fifty percent of the prison population which gives you a very good indication of how racism runs throughout society. Um, if you look at the, the, number, the homeless population and the population that live in poverty, it's overwhelmingly African-American or Latino or indigenous. The treatment of the indigenous peoples of the Americas continues to be utterly horrific. You know, people are herded into reservations. If you look at the difference in life expectancy between indigenous people and white people in the US, it's, you know, maybe 15 years difference in life expectancy. You know, there would be mass world, worldwide hysterical outrage if the difference between the life expectancy for Han Chinese and Uyghurs was 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, but it isn't. <laughs> um, so, you know, the capitalism has got, you know, these enormous problems that even very wealthy countries can't solve. And as I said to you before, the, one of the first things we noticed in Beijing coming from New York and coming from London is, mm -hmm. okay, you, one, one doesn't see homeless people. One doesn't see people begging on the streets. Well, I can walk outside of my front door and I would have to go maybe 30 meters before I saw someone um, that, that, that I saw so, someone who was li living on the streets. Um, you also notice that Beijing is a much calmer, a much cleaner, a much cleaner city than London or Beijing, uh, than London or New York. Um, the, the, the quality of life, you know, it's, it's a, China is a developing country, but the quality of life seems higher, I would say, than it is in London.